Okay, so let's start with the screen share of page 50 of the workbook. Uh, whoa, we're not getting to chapter 11 right away. <laughs> uh, that was a question. Some students asked me, how are we going to use this crap? And I, I kind of showed them a little bit. I think we're right around here. Yeah. So we're going to pick up right there today. Um, and so <clears throat> if you didn't hear me, if you were coming in there, uh, we're going to start uh, by finishing up chapter nine, then talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in the class for the next three weeks, take a break, then do chapter 10. So up until now, we've been talking about, uh, so you've got that page open. Let me just get this up here. It's easier. Whoops. Let me get me up there. There we go. All right. Just a window here. All right. So in this case, uh, I just want to kind of review something. Maybe you remember that the force that one exerts on two is equal and opposite to the force that two exerts <clears throat> on one. So equal and opposite, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. From this, if you recall in chapter nine, we learned that this means uh, effectively P of the system initial equals P of the system final. In other words, momentum is conserved. Now, this may seem very strange that all of a sudden I started talking about center of mass, but I want to point something out here. We know that the sum of forces acting on an object of mass M has some acceleration, right? So F equals MA. It turns out what we really mean by this is the force on the object determines the acceleration of the center of mass, effectively. And now, without getting too crazy here, it, saying that momentum is conserved uh, is one way of analyzing problems that have no external force. So if you recall, these, if these are the only forces and all other forces from the external environment were negligible, then we use this. So a big caveat here was assuming uh, force external uh, is approximately equal to zero. It's either negligible or it acts for a very short amount of time or in some way it was negligible. Well, let's think about what that means here. Oh, go ahead, Gonzalo. What's up? Um, I was wondering, does that mean like, uh, is that the same thing as saying like inertia is negligible? Inertia and mass are interchangeable terms. So it does not mean that. It means the force on that inertia is negligible. Got it? Oh, okay. So, yeah. uh, and we're actually going to cover that more when we talk about it in chapter 10 later today, but mass and inertia are interchangeable concepts. Okay. Good question. So let's think about what this does mean for a second. If you have negligible external force in some way, doesn't that also mean that your center of mass is not accelerating? That's true. And so I'm going to flip this around even more and show you another equation that relates to this chapter. You may recall, let's just talk about the center of mass and let's call it a vector. That would be x1 mass 1 plus x2 mass 2 all over m1 plus m2. So this is the center of mass. Okay, well, let's think about this. If you took a derivative of this and for the time being, we assume all the masses aren't changing. So if we're talking about a system of blocks or something without mass changes, the masses are all constant. If you take the derivative of this, you get the velocity of the center mass is V1 times M1 because the derivative of X would be V, right?
And similarly, you could get the, uh, so let me just. Sorry, it's a little sloppy and close together. The idea is you could keep going one step further and get the acceleration of the center of mass the same way. You could take a derivative of this equation. And so if I go to the screen share, that's where these equations came from. For group of objects, and this is how it relates. If the acceleration of the center of mass is zero, and the initial velocity of the center of mass is zero, then this is true. The center of mass doesn't change position. And this sounds a little bit wild, but basically if momentum is conserved, we can also say the center of mass initial is center of mass final. So yeah, all right, um, that's where this problem relates. So let's kind of walk through this one and see if you could imagine how this, uh, yeah, so basically <clears throat> these topics, center of mass and momentum are all related through Newton's third law and Newton's second law. That's what I was trying to say here. So in case you're thinking none of these problems seem to, this chapter seems kind of incongruous. It's, it's not, it just takes a weird kind of way of looking at things. So let's say you have a canoe and what problem is this? 9.43. Okay, and let's assume the center mass of the canoe is right at its center. And actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make this canoe a finite size so I know how to draw it. This is now the size of the canoe. Just so I can measure it easily. And so the center of that is right about there, I'm trying to do my best, okay? So there's the canoe and there's a zombie sitting here. I'm just gonna draw the zombie as a circle. And I think I said M1 is the mass of the zombie. M2 is the mass of the canoe. And I know that this total length here is capital L. All right. Hopefully you can see that a little better now. So now my question is this, if the zombie is sitting here and it starts walking, this is all in the water. So there's negligible friction here for sitting in the water. And here's the dock right here. <clears throat> and the canoe right now is butted up against the dock. My claim is, if this zombie is sitting here and tries to walk towards the dock, the canoe will move backwards, right? Because he has to push backwards on the canoe to make himself go forwards. I guess I'm assuming a male zombie here, okay? So if this zombie, walk, try, and let me actually do it this way. Okay. Imagine if you will, my hand is like the canoe, all right? And this is the zombie. This is a great demo, huh? <laughs> but so if I could, let me try and line it up perfectly here. All right, so as the zombie walks, he's gonna push the canoe back and end up somewhere right here. And the idea, again, I'll try and show you this. As the zombie walks, they're gonna push the canoe back and end up closer to the dock but not all the way to the dock. And that's because this is floating in water and so there's very little friction here. All right. So the claim is this. Right now, there's an upwards force, force on the canoe called the buoyant force. It's basically like a normal force in this instance. We'll learn more about that in chapter 14. There's also the weight of the system downwards. We're told that because it's sitting in the water, friction is negligible. So we're told friction is negligible. Because that's true, the sum of forces external is equal to zero. These two cancel out, friction's negligible. 
that means p initial equals p final. And in this case, the velocity of the center of mass initial should equal velocity center mass final. Initially, nobody's moving. So that means the center of mass should not move. That tells us that x initial center of mass should equal x final of the center of mass. That's cool. Said another way, if the zombie and the canoe are right here, the center of mass might be right about there. My claim is after the zombie walks to the other end of the canoe, it should still be right there. And so what happens here is the canoe has moved The center of mass of the canoe is now over here. The zombie is over here. And it got closer to the dock. But it didn't make it all the way. <clears throat> that, so why am I, oh, whoops, somebody's trying to get in. <clears throat> We are showing that you can use center of mass in an unusual way. This is different than most of the other problems we've attacked so far. Instead of having two blocks colliding or one block moving around, these are two blocks that are a system changing shape. This is a, defo a deformation of this object. And so we see that the center of mass shouldn't change even though the pieces push on each other. Hmm, cool. So if a bomb explodes or if a plane is flying through the air and it blows up, right? <clears throat> and it goes into all these different pieces, you can learn something about the plane by locating all the pieces, figuring out where they landed, you know where it should have gone. And if you know where all the other pieces are and you can't find a piece, that gives you an idea of where to look for the last piece because you know the center of mass should still follow the same trajectory of the plane as it was going down. So it's a way you could use this to study something or in a car crash, forensic science again. All right. Um, I don't know. Any questions about this? All right. So um, let me ask you this. When we do a center of mass problem, we usually pick a coordinate system. I claim there are four good choices of coordinate system for this problem. Give me one of them. <clears throat> Where is a good spot to put the origin of the coordinate system? Give me one idea. Right at the dock? At the dock. What is the advantage of putting the coordinate system right at the dock? Uh, well, then we can like know where it moved to um, by just like adding from zero, I guess. Yeah, okay. And I would say it this way. You said adding from zero. Do you agree that we will end up with no negative numbers? That's nice, right? By putting the dock here, every position is positive. So we never get any negative numbers. That's sweet. <clears throat> All right. What's another logical position? What's another good? So Jake made a good position. Uh, and that's because we get no negative values of x. What's another good spot? I think in the, in the center of mass of M2. Yeah, we could do it right here. That's a good spot. What's another one? At the end. At the end. What are the advantages of those? If you put your coordinate system here, x2 equals 0, right? at least for the first part of the problem, if you put your coordinate system here, x1 equals, so that's good because something is equal to zero and drops out. Huh, what's the last obvious spot? The other center of mass. Mm -hmm. The center of mass of the system. So a lot of times physicists love to use this one for, I'll show you more about that later, but there are the four good choices here. Obviously any choice would work. You could have chosen this spot. You could have chosen Detroit. You could have chosen Compton, wherever you want, 
but some choices are easier to do uh, mathematically. So, all right, let's start off by figuring out the initial center mass. Okay, so X center of mass initial is equal to We're gonna have X1, whoops, X2, M2. Sorry, I did them out of order and M2. And we've got M1 and X1, M1. So if we use the end of the dock as our coordinate system here, so if we're using the dock, what should I plug in for X2? What should I plug in for X2? Remember, X2 means the center of mass of object two. Zero. Is the center of mass of the canoe at zero? Is it uh, L half? L over L two. Yeah. yeah, and so depending what coordinate system, you may have chosen zero, and that might have worked for your problem, so I don't know. But here, I would say L over two, just because we're saying the dock is zero. So I'm saying that this is X equals zero right here for the whole problem. All right. Now, what's X one? Zero. That's not zero. X1 is where the zombie is located. Uh, L. L. Does that make sense? It would be zero if you put your coordinate system there, and maybe that's what you did, and if so, that's cool. All right. Now, my claim is that the center of mass in the end should be the same. Now, let me write it in the same goofy order, just so it's... Okay. Okay. So now, do we know this distance? Off the top of your head, do you know it? No. That's what we're trying to figure out in this problem. We don't we know this distance is L. We know that the center of mass hasn't moved, but we don't know this right away. You probably could infer it and maybe you have already figured it out or maybe you read the problem statement. But let's assume for now we don't know this. So let's give it a name. What do you want to call this? Pony. Pony. Pony it is. <laughs> okay, so pony is the distance between the canoe and the dock. All right, it doesn't matter, right? Okay. So now let's go down here and try and use this new term pony. That's a little sloppy. I'm just gonna call it P for pony. That way it's not so hard for me to write. Okay, so P for pony. Do we know X2 or X1 in terms of this new parameter we've created pony? What is X1? Pony. Pony, right? What is X2? Pony plus L? Pony plus, it's to the center of M2. So Alonzo over two. Yes, nice. Pony plus L over two, right? So now in this case, because there's negligible external forces, my claim is I could set this equal to that. These two things are equal. 
that was the point of all that mumbo jumbo we were saying about momentum, Newton's third law and all that. If there's negligible external forces, we can do this. If I set these equal, what's going to cancel out? The mass. The total mass in the bottom is going to drop out. And then I don't know if you could see this. There's an M2 times L over 2 right here. There's an M2 times L over 2 right here. So that term is going to drop out. So out of all this, well, let's just do the next line of work. So this one is not really done in the solution because I usually do it in class. So let's actually do it. Sorry, I got to sit down because it's so low here. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to set x center of mass initial equal to x center of mass final, which tells us Let's take a second to make sure I didn't screw up. I just said, let this equation equal that equation. This was there, M2, P, 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 okay, got it. Here, L over two, got the one, okay. And like we were saying, the denominators cancel. So now to save space, I'm just gonna erase that. And what I am saying is this term right here L over two times M two should cancel with this term right here. So what are we left with? In the end, we get M one L one, whoops, M one L equals P times this term drops out. We get a M two plus M one. So out of all that pony is equal to M1 times uh, whatever that junk is. Notice the units work out. Pony was a distance. It was the distance from the dock. What do you think about all that? It's a different way to use center of mass and we could use it to describe how objects move. I'm going to say one more thing about this, very subtle. Okay, imagine this is the canoe and here's the zombie, right? As the zombie walks forwards, we know the canoe gets pushed backwards. Or if you're a zombie here and you walk backwards, that would get pushed forwards, whatever. But now here's the thing. You may be saying, well, how come this canoe starts at rest and the zombie starts pushing it? Shouldn't it stay moving? Well, remember... To start moving, the zombie pushes it backwards, but then the zombie has to stop him or herself. And so the zombie then pushes backwards and stops the canoe as well. So basically the zombie accelerates the canoe to get it moving and then decelerates the canoe to stop it when it stops as well. So, yeah. All right. Let's go back and look at this picture here. Um, and at any time, ask any questions you want. Whew. Okay, so this is a different style of doing problems, and our suggested method to survive all zombie attacks is put zombies in canoe, but make sure they're at the end of the canoe that's away from the dock, and then you're good to go. So now that we've solved zombies, I think we could clearly move on to the next problem. Um, oh. By the way, why should you care about this? I'll throw in a little problem in a minute. All right, now here is a, a slightly different problem. Um, suppose you have a person, uh, they're in the center of a board and they're walking. So this shows you, I used to run a demo in class like this. 
And instead of having a human being, what I would do is I'd put a little remote control car on top of a piece of foam. And underneath the foam, we'd put a bunch of these like uh, Arizona iced tea cans. Uh, they were long and they were light and they had negligible mass. Let me get this person in here. And so we'd put a whole bunch of Arizona iced tea cans and you could actually see this in the classroom, do the measurements and it was cool, but we can't do it right now. So we're not going to. But if you're curious, if this works, you can actually see the idea working. Now, wait a minute. I just made the claim that as a zombie or a person walks forward, they push backwards on the surface be be underneath them. Does this work on the earth as well? Yes. When you walk forwards, you cause the rotation rate of the earth to change. By an amount so small, no one could ever measure it, but you do it. So every day when you walk around and stop, you're changing the world. For better or worse, I don't know. All right. But yeah, you, you can change the world by just walking. All right. Anyways, yeah. So um, if you are curious, uh, here is where things get really nasty. I don't know if you remember relative velocity at all. Relative velocity starts to matter. If you're a physicist, these problems might be good for you. And so the idea is it gets very tricky because the person will walk at this speed relative to the board, but then what is their speed relative to the earth? If you think about it, look at this zombie problem up here. In this problem, as the zombie walks, maybe they're walking at five miles an hour, but they don't go five miles an hour towards the dock because the road beneath them is moving backwards. So how would you figure out their velocity relative to the actual dock? If you're curious about that, this problem shows you how that is done. To be honest, I'm probably not gonna put a test on the final about this stuff, okay? Uh, a question on the final. But if you're a physics major, you should know this stuff, especially if you wanna do beam physics. All right, here's another interesting one. When you look at this one, there's a tension down on each side of this thing and there's a tension up. However, when you look at this thing as a system, it's actually the bigger mass is gonna go down, right? So isn't the center of mass gonna keep moving down a little bit? As a result, this tension is not actually having to support the weight of everything beneath it. And you can do this problem if you care. Uh, and so there's a small correction to the, the force on the ceiling associated with the center of mass falling. You don't actually have to support the center of mass completely. So there's another weird example. And here's another uh, fun variation on that. This one, um, here is a problem where imagine you did a video of a ball bouncing. I think you saw a video. You could imagine creating this plot with tracker, right? And it looked something like this, where there's a discontinuity at the bottom. Well, from this video, you could get the speed of the ball just before impact, the speed of the ball after impact. You could get the collision time. You could get the impulse and the force. Or you could get a plot of V versus... So we see that the stuff we did in chapter two with these plots and video capture could relate to momentum. So I'm going to leave this in here as a uh, review question for the final. Just wanted to let you know about that. Just kind of bringing this back. Um, believe it or not, this is a true story. I know a guy named Moon. This is his last name. And he kept getting emails from uh, someone in India with Moon with three O's in their name. And now I guess they keep track because they would send each other the emails that got sent to the wrong person. But he works at Apple now, and I'll see if I can get him to um, come and talk to us. But I doubt it. He's too busy. He doesn't. I don't know. Yeah. So we'll see. I keep trying to get him to come and talk, but he's like, ah, I don't know, man. So we'll see if I can get him to be a guest speaker. Oh. All right. And then, uh, oh, but if he comes, make sure you ask him if he's still getting emails from this moon with three O's. Okay. All right. We'll see if I can get him to come in. Next, rocket science. A lot of people say it's not rocket science. Well, I guess it is now going to be rocket science. Now, um, okay, let's look at this briefly. If you're a physics major, again, this is probably a good problem for you. So I want to briefly look at this. 
imagine you had a rocket. So I'm looking at this upper picture. This is the before picture. Okay. Your rocket is moving with speed V. Now there's some fuel inside the rocket. So we're doing a simplified model of the rocket where it's basically a chassis and some fuel. Now in the next picture, imagine one unit of fuel. We break up that giant blob of fuel into discrete chunks. And let's say this chunk of fuel gets spit backwards and it's ejected at some speed V subscript E. It's ejected at that speed relative to the rocket. Okay, so let's say the rocket can spit out fuel at a rate of 100 meters per second. Obviously, that is not the speed at which this goes backwards. That's the speed at which it goes backwards relative to the rocket. As the rocket goes forwards, it's quite possible the fuel actually goes forwards too. Anyways, more on that later. Um, but yeah, so let's say we've got this situation. Uh, I haven't actually thought that through, if you could ever get this to the point where the fuel is actually moving forwards despite throwing it out the back. Uh, that would be a bad rocket design probably, but I think it is, right? You could imagine throwing a baseball backwards out of a car at a speed less than you're driving forwards. So it's possible. Now, when you throw something out the back, if it's a tiny, tiny bit of mass, so again, let's say this amount of mass is dm, the rocket is gonna go forwards. But check this out. The rocket has initial mass capital M. Whoops, oh, whoops, right here. When a chunk of mass is ejected, the mass of the rocket goes down. So we get this kind of double effect. Not only are you throwing something backwards, which will tend to speed you up, you're also lowering your mass, which should make it easier for you to go forwards. So in this case, this should help you go forwards. Now, if you write down the conservation momentum problem for this, this is what it looks like. This is the initial momentum of the rocket to the right. This is the mass of the, whoops, sorry. Let me get my red here. So this is the initial momentum of the rocket, P initial. All that over here is the final momentum of the system, the rocket and the ejected fuel. This is the new mass of the rocket, and this is its new uh, velocity to the right. This negative comes from the fact of you ejected the fuel to the left. dm is a positive quantity, but ve uh, minus v has to do with the fact of you ejected at a certain speed, right? Uh, like this, if you eject it at 500, but the thing's moving to the right at 100, you only go at 400 to the left. So that's all, that's all this crap is right here. Now what we could do is we can get rid of this variable dm by saying, well, wait a minute, dm is the opposite of dm, uppercase, lowercase, right? The mass of the rocket should go down when you spit fuel of mass dm out the back. DM should be negative. You're losing mass. After all that, this ends up becoming a plus. We do a bunch of math. We get down here to this. The solution to that, does anybody know how to solve that right off the top of their head? Just integrate both sides, right? You can't integrate both sides yet. You have to switch the variables? Yeah, separate before you integrate. Look, there's an M on this side. You get the M's with the M's and then get this V over to the other side. Now this is a constant, so we don't have to worry about that, but we do have to get the M's with the M's. So separate before you integrate. This is chapter two. So here's that separation of variables. Notice we get a uh, VE is a constant. So this DV just becomes that. I cross multiplied here. This dm over m becomes a logarithm. The minus sign flips the logarithm upside down and you get this equation right here. What does this show us? Usually think of a rocket ship as being, uh, right, this rocket here has a huge amount of fuel inside. The mass of the rocket is mainly fuel, hopefully. As a result, mass initial should be much bigger than mass final. 
hopefully, several times bigger if, if we can. And so in that case, this logarithm should be some small positive number, like two or three, hopefully, maybe five if you're lucky. I have no idea. Now, this is a large number. That's the fuel that has been ejected. And what we see now is you can actually get the velocity as a function of how much fuel is left in the rocket. Now, if you knew the burn rate, if you know how rapidly mass final is changing, you could then write this in, as a function of time. So we see that you could, in theory, get velocity as a function of time out of all this. Great. That's rocket science. That's cool. Um, there's a bunch of other things here. All right, great. Now, I will be honest with you. This is something I don't tend to put on a final exam either. So I wanted to talk about it. I think it's important for physics majors to be exposed to this. I'm not putting this on the test. You got that? Just making sure that's clear. So the zombie in the canoe, not on the final. This thing, not on the final. But it's important to see it. Let's talk about one last thing in this chapter, I think. Um, all right. Oh, these are kind of fun. This is a classic problem. Usually you get to this in the next class. This is a fun problem. Here's one. Let's do 9.52 together right now. When an object hits the earth, it appears that momentum is not conserved. For example, oh, let me, let me move down just a little bit. So let's say you have the earth here. This is before. This is going to be after. You have a ball here. It's moving downwards. Let's say this was an asteroid from deep space. And I don't know, or maybe it's an asteroid hitting the moon. When it hits, it's going to bang on the ground. And then it's eventually going to come to rest, right? Initially, there is some momentum. P initial Y is less than zero. Afterwards, it says there is no momentum. I thought momentum was conserved. What the heck's going on here? Somebody help me. I think it is conserved because it's like the problem we did where if everybody was like on the North Pole jumping at the mm -hmm. same time, we know that the Earth did move, but it was just so negligible that we couldn't tell. Exactly. So after this smashes into the Earth, the entire Earth is moving down a little bit, but it's just so small we can't see it. Believe it or not, here's the other thing too. On the way to hit it, the Earth is actually moving up to meet it ever so slightly as well due to gravity. We'll talk about that in chapter 13. So yeah, whatever. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. It has to do with the fact that the Earth's mass is really big. And if the Earth's math is mass is really big, sometimes it appears that momentum is not conserved, even though it really is. All right, nice job. Let's go one more. I mentioned this about center of mass frame. So remember back in chapter four, at the end of chapter four, we did um, relative velocity. So if I could imagine this is the center of mass right here and it's moving. If you have these two objects moving, the center of mass is also moving. Remember the velocity of the center of mass is equal to V1 M1 plus V2 M2 all over the total mass. I'll just say M tote. Okay. So that is how you could compute this, right? If these two objects are moving, fine. That means the center of mass is moving. And usually it's moving. Think about this. Wherever they impact, that's where the center of mass is moving to, right? because eventually the two objects will be right on top of each other and the center of mass had better be right there next to them. So especially if these are very small objects, like if imagine if they were perfect point particles, you know they're gonna collide right here. Everything's headed to this point. We could tell the center of mass is going to be where they collide. Notice that one is moving a little bit faster. It's a little bit farther away. Great. Here is what I'm saying. You could talk about the motion relative to the center of mass. In that case, the center of mass remains fixed. We subtract this velocity from each term to get its relative velocity. And now this is the velocity in what's called the center of mass frame. 
And for collisions in modern physics, this is a very common trick. What you do is this is called the lab frame. And this is the center of mass frame. What you do is you take objects that are moving in the real world and you measure their velocities. Then you measure the velocity of the center of mass. Then what you do is you change everything to the center of mass frame where the center of mass becomes the origin. You set this as your coordinate system. The center of mass doesn't move. Aha, this is a lot like that zombie in a canoe problem in 2D. And this is how you would handle that upgrading that zombie in the canoe problem to a 2D problem. You could have two objects moving around in the center mass frame, they both collide. So um, basically what the scientists will do is they'll convert into here, into the center mass frame, do some problem, then back convert into the real world. And so it turns out there's sometimes some easier math in the center of mass frame. Um, here's how you could do all that if you care. Oh, great. Lastly, uh, this is only valid as long as external forces are negligible. Big surprise, this is not on the test either. But if you are a physicist and you're gonna be doing beam physics, there you go. I have covered it. I feel like we've done our legal responsibility to talk about this, but that's not on the test. So thank you for putting up with all that, everybody. And that I think is the last topic in chapter nine. Let's confirm I didn't forget anything. So these are things you should say in a physics course, but I'm not gonna test you on them. But if you're a physics major, you should do it. Okay, we're up to chapter 10, rotation. All right, so before we take our break, I wanna go into the, the Canvas class and kinda show you what's up. We have now finished chapter nine. Oh man, give me a sec. The old Canvas logout, you know the deal. Whoops, wrong zoom button. This one, this one. All right, so let's take a look at where we are. Okay, so that was week eight, spring break. It's unfortunate spring break is not infinite. Okay, week nine, how are we doing right now? We are actually ahead. Look, week nine, we're supposed to be doing chapter nine. We have just finished it. I wasn't sure if we would. I thought we would actually finish it next week. So we're going to push ahead and start chapter 10 tonight. This is awesome. You got a lab tomorrow on coding for 2D motion. Great. Let's look at week 10 now. Next week, what's going on? The drop deadline is... Friday of next week. Next Friday. Okay. Now, we've got a group activity next week. Look carefully, read carefully. It's on chapter nine, even though it's in week 10. Got it? So this is gonna be momentum, center of mass type stuff. Something nasty, I'm sure. Okay, got that. So you, your goal is to make sure you're done. And this is gonna be, I think, next Wednesday. This is so strange to me, it drives me crazy. But notice, sometimes it lists the date, sometimes it doesn't. I don't, there seems to be no rhyme or reason. So this is why it's easy for me to make mistakes. It's just not a consistent software. Who cares? Let's move on. So finish chapter nine by this weekend and you're in great shape. Don't and you're in trouble. Now we're going to keep grinding away and notice next week's lab is on center of mass. So again, if you don't have this stuff all done, that lab is going to kill you. The following week, look at this. Week 11 is a special week. Uh, if you look here, notice there's no quizzes, there's no group activities, and lab is going to be practice exams from chapters five through eight. So you could also finish all of your chapter 10 work. So with a little luck, basically this whole week will be do homework from chapter 10, do practice exams. So week 11 is your last kind of catch up week. After that, just endless punishment, okay? There's a quiz on chapter 10, so you better be done with chapter 10 by the end of week 11. And then we go uh, into lab and we're doing rotational kinematics, week 12, et cetera. You could start, okay, there's, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, chapter 10 is a big deal. We, 
it's it's going to come up multiple times. So I think that's enough on where the class is going. We see that week 11, you get a reprieve. So hopefully you, you know, either enjoyed your spring break or whatever, but by the end of week 11, you'd better be on top of it or you will get lost and, and, and toast. All right. Any questions about that before we take our break? Anything um, at all? Chapter 14. Is yes. that on the final? Yes. I've been writing some devious questions for the final. So let's take a look at that one. At first, I wasn't sure if I was going to do that, but I was able to rearrange things a little bit. So notice there's chapter 14. Um, and so here, uh, there's so basically the only way you're going to be assessed on chapter 14 is by uh, one problem on the final or maybe one problem that's got numbers and one concept question, that kind of thing. So the final exam is going to definitely have a problem from chapter 14, but that problem will uh, be very similar to one of the problems in the workbook on chapter 14. So it's going to be, yeah, I don't want to say nearly identical, but it'll be very similar. Um, is that Would good on that? Homework, homework check? What's that? It's, it's, um, it's not a homework check exactly. It's, it's going to be its own unique problem. It's not one that's exactly in the workbook. But if you do the problems in chapter 14, it will be very similar to one of those. It's not going to be as different as some of the ones I throw at you on midterms or quizzes. So it won't be added to like the homework check then? From no, the no, 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 no. The only spot chapter 14 shows up is one problem on the final or one problem plus one concept question on the final. I haven't decided yet. Is that good? Thank you. Yeah, and when we get to the final a little closer, I'll tell you more about that. I've started writing them, and it's going to take me several weeks to make the finals. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to be working on them until like the week before. So I've started one question. I got 16 versions of that one, and I got another one. I got 16 of that. So um, it's very difficult to make questions that are of comparable difficulties, but totally unique. <laughs> it's very hard. And so my goal is to keep it fair, but to not have the same problem so people can't cheat. And it's, it takes me a lot of time. But for example, the kinds of things I think about when I'm making these different versions is, okay, do they have approximately the same amount of algebra? Okay, do they have the same amount approximately of minus sign errors? Do they have the same amount of trig requirements? Do they have the same amount of coordinate system issues? Do they have this? And so I make up totally different problems and I'm not gonna tell you them, but um, yeah, they're, yeah, they're unique to the point where if you try to help each other out, you're going to slow yourself down and lose points. So basically, it's going to keep you honest. Plus, during the oral exam, if you come in and you can't explain your own work, I'll be like, why did you do that? And you'll be like, uh, I don't know. I'll be like, well, okay, then I'll just give you a zero. So yeah, know your own work. And it's okay to not understand something. Well, uh, yeah, more on that when we get close, all right? Uh, other questions? Anybody? Anything? Oh, go for it, Alan. Um, I just had a question on the oral exam. When is it yes. going to be? Oh, say, sorry, say again? When is that going to be? So what we're going to do is we take the final on a Monday of that week, and then I've got an app, and I haven't, I haven't opened that app yet. I'm going to wait till after the drop deadline. And then what you're going to do is you're going to schedule an appointment sometime later in the week. And it's going to be a 25 minute appointment. And usually the first question I ask you in the oral exam is I'll look for some problem that you did really bad on. And I'll say, okay, you really skunked up problem eight. How should you have approached it? And if you, yeah. And so the idea is this, here's, here's kind of the final in a nutshell. During the final, don't talk to anybody. After the final, talk to everybody and learn what you screwed up. And then when you come in, I'm going to say, look, you got a zero on this one. Do you know how to fix it up? Because if you do, I'll give you some points on the, on the oral exam so you don't get a zero for the whole test. Uh, does that make some sense, Alan? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so you're going to set an appointment with an app. Uh, later on and it, it'll be a link I send you and you send stick something yeah cool that sounds nice all right yeah. yeah and it'll be after the drop deadline and I'll send a canvas notification when I send it out and if you've got a very busy schedule 
immediately sign up. If you don't have a busy schedule, maybe let everybody else pick what they want. Cool? Sounds good. Yeah, hey. yeah. All right, good question. Others? So, uh, this is Yara, you could go. Um, for the final, the time for the final, is it gonna be the same time as class? Cause I saw on like line, it was like, a, you downloaded at 2 p.m. but I'm still in lab during that time. Yeah, so the idea was um, I was going to give some grace period for uh, downloading, uploading, and I'll give you kind of a window. So the idea is it's a two hour test. So the test should only take two hours. And you'll see me emailing people like, it's two hours, you better turn this thing in or you get a zero on it. Uh, yeah, and so people who are late get a massive deduction. Like, uh, I don't know what it was. I think one year I took 40 points off for one minute late. So um, yeah, out of, out of 200, that's a lot. Uh, or 180 or whatever. Yeah, so basically if you screw up being late, you get a massive, massive penalty. Um, drops you a letter grade or more. So, um, but I do put in a grace period on either end. That way, you know, you can, so it should be a pure two hour test. So I'll probably put in 15 minutes before and 15 minutes after. Now, now uh, there's going to be a different window for each class and there'll be different um, questions for each class too. So yours will be two hours plus maybe 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after something like that. Got it? Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess some people might have an advantage in that they could get an extra 15 minutes. I don't know how, how else I could handle that, though, because I got to give some time for, for turning the damn thing in. So um, I have to put in a little extra window at the front and the end just to handle that. Cool. So yours will probably start at 4.15, I think. Right. And the other groups will start at, at whatever it is. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I have to update that. Cool. Other questions, uh, Gonzalo. What was yours? Yeah, um, I'm. I'm still wondering, like, about like the problem with the asteroid. Like, you know, it's basically like a collision problem, right? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, it's perfectly inelastic. And I was thinking, like, um, is there any like applications, like, in terms of energy? Because that all, would also mean energy is conserved. Well, energy is conserved in the universe. However, it's lost to the two-body system that experienced the collision. Because what's going to happen is, now, we haven't done physics 162 yet. We don't know about thermal energy. The idea is when the uh, asteroid smashes in, the ground heats up. And that changes macroscopic external motion into microscopic atomic motion. Uh, and so it's not that energy is lost, it's that we can't see it anymore because it's now the molecules moving. Got it? So kinetic potential to thermal? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, and so in every real life experiment, there's thermal energy and it's just dominates everything we do. And even though it may be a small fraction over time, that just, and then what happens eventually? The earth radiates that energy back into space. And yeah. So then that goes and it's lost to the planet. Yeah, that's the stuff I want to learn about, like energy. Yeah, we'll talk about this probably at the end of 163, but also in 162. That's when we talk about work and thermal energy, engines, things like that. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. because yeah. I just think it has a lot of bio applications. That's why I was Absolutely. like interested Absolutely. in it. Yeah, and we could talk more in office hours too, for sure. That's a good question. Um, you know what? I might see. Let me see if I have one more here. before we take our break. Let me see here, come on, come on. I'm trying to see if I had a simulation for this that might help visualize it. Let me see here if I have this. I thought I made one of these sometime. Here's one. So if you're curious, right, you could have um, these different positions here. Notice, look at this. Here's the center of mass equation. Let me make this a little bigger. Whoops. Hopefully you could see that a little bit now. Sorry about that. So here's an in initial position of two rocks. Here's their size. 
here they i just drew i called them ball one and ball two i got a little lazy okay notice this is just defining the mass here's their velocities i defined velocity look at the center of mass position here okay this is the mass one times its position one mass two position two all over right and then I'm gonna draw a line. And so now what are we gonna do? This is exactly what we're gonna do in, in class this week. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna write some time and a time increment and a simulation speed. And then this is just saying, take the old position of one and change it by the velocity times the increment of time. Do the same thing and watch this when we run it. Whoops, let me run that again where it's, you can see it. The idea is the center of mass keeps trucking along at its standard rate. Now, if you wanted to do this, like let's say one of them was the Earth. Oh, come on, are you kidding me? Whoops, that's still the same one. All right, let's run this again. There we go. Now what happens is we barely see any change at all. Aha, look at the color. The color didn't change that much. Why? So I think somewhere in here, the color is going to be, it's a weighted average of the colors. So in this case, that's why. But so what if number one is moving? What if number one is really big and this is really small? And let's say... Uh, Where's the velocity? Let's say the velocity of one is close to zero. Like this. This would be like an asteroid hitting the earth. Oh shoot, they're not gonna hit each other now. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that. <laughs> That's kind of funny. But this is the idea of the asteroid hitting the Earth. We don't really notice much change. Let's make it a little bit less exaggerated. Sorry. I don't know if this is helping at all, but... There we could see it flying in there. All right, that's cool. Um, let's probably... Let's go ahead and take our break now. But if you guys want to learn more about that, we could talk about that in lab tomorrow. But you could see you could do this kind of stuff in a code as well. That's all I wanted to point out. Okay, 10 minutes, 542. Okay, let's take that break.
Okay, whoops. Sorry about that. I can't remember what time we took our break. Are we close? Is it time to come back? I think so. Hopefully it's not coming back early. All right. So um, <clears throat> any questions before we start back up? Oh, okay. Got it. All right. Thank you. And then 